Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Wherever you're listening around the world, a very warm welcome from London here in the UK. Here is today's news in electric cars and the future of transport. I go through every EV article online so you don't have to. My name is Martin Lee and this is your EV News Daily for Wednesday the 4th of April 2018. Coming up today we'll talk about a new EV from Geely, Buick head to China and a new electric van from VW. But first of all we have to start with Tesla news because it was Tesla quarterly results day today. And let's run through first of all what Tesla say about this. Then we'll get into, I've been through all of the news articles I could find today from the EV press to the mainstream media and the car blogs just to pick out the best, most interesting opinion and comments on that. But we'll start with the facts and we'll get to that in a minute. And then I'd love to know what you think, by the way, about the Tesla story today. Well, Q1 production totaled 34,000. 494 vehicles. That's a 40% increase, says Tesla, from Q4. And by far the most productive quarter in Tesla's history. Almost 25,000 of them were Model S and X, and 10,000 were Model 3. Now, the Model 3 output increased exponentially, representing a fourfold increase over the last quarter. This is the fastest growth of any automotive company in the modern era. If this rate of growth continues, it will exceed even that of Ford with the Model T. Now, Tesla say that we were able to double to double the weekly production rates of Model 3 during the quarter by rapidly addressing production and supply chain bottlenecks, including several short factory shutdowns to upgrade the equipment. In the past seven days, Tesla produced 2,020 Model 3 vehicles. In the next seven days, Tesla expects to produce 2,000 Model S and X vehicles and the same again for Model 3. They say it's a testament to the ability of the Tesla production team that Model 3 volume now exceeds S and X combined. What took the team five years with the S and X took nine months with the Model 3. Wow. Well, Tesla continue that given the progress made thus far and upcoming actions for further capacity improvements, that's a good sign, uh, they expect that the Model 3 production rate will climb rapidly through Q2. Tesla say we continue to target a production rate of 5,000 units per week within three months, laying the groundwork for Q3 to have the long-sought ideal combination of high volume, good gross margin, and strong positive operating cash flow. As a result, Tesla does not require an equity or debt release, a debt raise this year, apart from standard credit lines. Well, their report continues that Q1 deliveries, this is different to production, right? Deliveries totaled 29,980 vehicles, of which almost 12,000 Model S and X, uh, and sorry, 12,000 S, 10,000 X, and over 8,000 Model 3, that's delivered. Net orders for S and X, an all-time Q1 record. Demand remains very strong. Model S and X customer vehicles in transit were high. 4,060 Model S and X vehicles were in transit to customers. And Model 3 had about 2,000 in transit to customers. They're going to be delivered in the next few days and weeks, which keeps us on track, they say, for our full year. 2018 Model S and X delivery guidance. Finally, they make two points at the end of their press release. And this is interesting because I think these are two comments aimed at two certain groups of people who are very critical, not only of Tesla, of Elon Musk, of the share price. You get you start to wonder why people start talking down a company so much with every article they print. Well, let's see what they say. Point one, the quality of of Model 3 coming out of production is the highest level we've ever seen across all our products. This is reflected in the overwhelming delight experienced by our customers with their Model 3s. Our initial customer satisfaction score for Model 3 is 93%. It's the highest score in Tesla's history. That's their first point, and you know who that's aimed at. It's aimed at everyone going online and going, oh, look at the panel gap, right, from a, from a new car company who are finding their way and getting it right. By the way, I know their cars are expensive. I know that if you buy a Tesla, even now, you are largely a beta tester for them. But they are under a lot of criticism from people who, I don't know, these people haven't necessarily built a fantastic car themselves. They're just internet commentators. Anyway, second point is this. I quote, net model three reservations remain stable in Q1. 
The reasons for order cancellation are almost entirely due to delays in production in general and delays in the availability of certain options like dual motor or wheel drive and a small battery pack. As described above, owner happiness with the product is extremely high. We would like to thank our customers, say Tesla, suppliers and investors for their continued patience and belief in Tesla, end quote. And you know that second point, which they make a point of making as well, is aimed at everyone who says, oh, everyone's cancelling their Model 3 cars, no one's going to wait so long for that. You, you said you were going to make a $35,000 car, you're blatantly not, you lied to everybody, where's this $35,000 car, where's the small battery? When all along, they said we start with the highest margins first. <sighs> that was a good day. That was a really good day, especially in the last week when... Tesla's stock price has taken a massive hit. They've had that horrible accident in California, uh, which they released the data on. And everybody seems to have been up in their face for the last week, especially around the crash as well, which is such a sensitive subject for the family of the people involved, the man that died as well. It's such a horrible thing to have to be dealing with. If you work at Tesla, you should go to work every day and you should be making amazing cars to delight people and to work out a way forward for mobility in the next 5, 10, 15 years. What you shouldn't have to do, and I'm sure it's just part of your job, if you're an engineer at Tesla, is you go to work one day and your boss says to you, there's been this accident, you've got to go pull all of the data, they're going to bring the car in or we're going to get to the car, you've got to go and get in a car now and go to the crash site and pull the data from the car, was he holding the wheel and... and was autopilot engaged? How many times did we want him to put his hands back on the wheel? It's a horrible thing because it's such an emotional thing for the, the man's family. The people at Tesla, that's what they've been doing as their day job. And yet people go online and make comment about it. I think in, they are insensitive at times and they don't quite appreciate it. This is a human thing that's happening. Real kind of keyboard heroes that start bashing away and giving out their opinion. So what do the news sites say about it then? And what's the opinion from those thought leaders, uh, as they say? Well, Autoblog were pretty factual, actually, but they did make this point. Uh, shares of the Palo Alto, California-based company, which had fallen a fifth in value over the past week, jumped 6.4% in pre-market trade in New York, and that increase continued through the day. End quote. It's a volatile stock, isn't it? I mean, if you're invested in, if you saw the price go down to 250 and you thought, I'm going to buy some now, You've made lots of money in the last 48 hours, but good luck to you. I mean, it's it's too volatile, too choppy. You know, the only thing I invest in is my pension. Someone does that for me, and they are very boring stocks because in 20 years' time, <laughs> I want to make sure the money's there. You know, hey, look, I'm sure Tesla's going to be fine, but it's not the business I'm in, and this isn't a financial podcast. Right, moving on. Electric Cars reports say that the Tesla delivery count should be viewed as slightly conservative as the company only count a car is delivered if it's transferred to the customer and all the paperwork is correct. Final numbers could actually increase by 0.5%. Inside EV's take was this. Everything appears to be falling into place finally for the Model 3 and perhaps even Tesla's off-delayed production ramp. Let's hope it's all upwards from here. Great comment. And finally, The Drive said this. Considering the amount of bad press Tesla's gotten over the past few days, this relatively sunny production report is well-timed. But Tesla needs to keep its eye on the prize and continue ramping up Model 3 production over the next three months. Yes, yes, you have stated the bleeding obvious. They absolutely do need to work on that um, that backlog of, ooh, about half a million Model 3s. I'm sure they're very aware of how many they have to make. <laughs> good luck to them. And if you're a Model 3 reservation holder, good luck to you and your patients as well. You'll get one. And it's coming. Right, moving on. And let's talk about all things Fisker. Well, if you're going to release news on a day like today when Tesla released their announce uh, results, it better be good news. And it's hard to get a look in to the news today. Henrik Fisker insists that work continues on an entry-level EV priced at $40,000. In fact, Fisker are working on several ideas all at once, including the E-Motion and the Orbit, which will use solid-state batteries. He told Autocar, I quote, in the future, people are going to choose a mobility device that's best suited for the trip they're doing. It could be an electric bike or your own car, somebody else's car or a shuttle. I don't think the old ideal where somebody says, we're only going to make sports cars, is going to work in the future. 
People will have four or five mobility devices, and if they like your brand, you should be able to service them in all areas, end quote. So, for instance, Rimac, which made the uh, Rimac 1, and only 10 of them, but then said we're going to make the Rimac C underscore 2, and then make 150 of them, uh, but they're going to be $2.1 million. And then 150 millionaires went... I'll have one. And they sold out. Right. So Rimac are doing OK with that business model. But Fisker says that's the wrong business model. You've got to make four or five devices from an electric bike to uh, a top end car. And you've got to create a brand and people will come to you and fall in love with your brand. And arguably, that is what Tesla is doing, but is on a very, very long journey and is kind of barely into it, really, because when you think Model 3 is just starting to get off the ground and already people are going come on what's the model y gonna be like well give them a break and i'm sure the model y will have details announced this year in 2018 and so with 55 million dollars worth of pre-orders for the semi-truck already from a handful of people yeah things are going okay long journey and that's what henrik fisker wants to do good luck to him well, moving on to vans, which might not be as sexy as a Rimac C2, but per miles driven make a huge difference to air quality. Well, the VW electric van is going to be called the E-Crafter after their regular van, the Crafter. It's going to make its debut on the 24th of April, ahead of more testing in May. Now, Fleet Point point out that the first test vehicles were actually handed over to a major group of European customers at the Volkswagen Commercial Vehicles headquarters in Hanover in December. They say that by allowing the vehicle to undergo tests with selected operators, uh, the company's going to be able to incorporate findings and learnings into the final design and production version of the zero-emission van. The E-Crafter's lithium-ion battery is completely completely integrated into the underbody, which won't affect the loading area of the van. And on a CCS charger, you're going to get 45 minutes to go 0 to 80%. And from a wall box, if you're doing level 2 charging, uh, they reckon five and a half hours. But they don't say the size of the battery. What battery size does a short-range van need? We're talking sort of 100Ks here, urban delivery, that kind of thing. We'll find out. Well, a couple more stories, and they both revolve around China. Actually, Buick has announced more vehicles for China. They're going to introduce the Velite 6 plug-in hybrid and the Velite 6 EV to join the portfolio against the Velite 5 and the LaCrosse hybrid. All we know so far that in 2017, Buick said they would have a range extender coming. Now, the extended range EV, or the ER EV uh, consists of General Motors EVT variable transmission, a permanent magnet motor, and direct injection engine coupled with a lithium ion battery pack. Now, Buick said the electric driving range is 62 miles and the gas engine is there to back it up. I'm not sure with their range extender, it wasn't clear if, because it's got a big enough battery, does the range extender provide electrons? as a generator for the battery and the battery drives the motors or is it like some of the other chinese companies uh, is it like the what they call a range extender which is a battery and an engine but with no plug so quite a big battery but you've always got to put gas in to power the battery We'll find out. Uh, right, the final story is about Geely and staying in China and a domestic Chinese maker. They of Volvo fame, Geely, has launched a new, or will launch a new, plug-in hybrid EV called the Borui, G-E, B-O-R-U-I. Borui? Borui. Yeah, either way. It combines a three-cylinder 1.5-litre a petrol engine with an electric motor, seven-speed clutch, a gearbox rather. Uh, the engine, you might be wondering, where's that coming from? Yeah, you guessed it, Volvo. It already powers the XC40 T3 and it will eventually be adopted by the Swedish company's upcoming electrified models of the 40 series and their link vehicles. You may recall that Volvo being the, the first really big Western car maker to say all of our models are going to be electrified, not electric, and they're well on the way to doing that. The Burui, the Burui GE, uh, is revealed in a few days, April the 9th. It'll be on sale in the summer. In the cabin, you get a massive infotainment system, a 12.2-inch touchscreen display. The pictures look amazing, by the way. It provides access to functions. You get wireless charging for your smartphones. You get ambient lighting and LED decorations. Despite the big screen in the middle, though, the actual 
instrument cluster is going to be a traditional one to keep the costs down. And that's where we'll end it today. I would love to spread the word about electric cars, so if you can, share this with one person, or maybe more, but at least one person who would be interested, you and I together, can spread the word of electric cars. You can listen to every previous episode of the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, TuneIn, and of course the blog at evnewsdaily.com. If you subscribe, you get it first and free and automatically. And if you want to catch up with us on Twitter, at EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you tomorrow.